Okay. Uh, hello. Give me 20 bucks. Hello. Give me 20 bucks. Okay, this is working. Uh, good morning and welcome to everyone. Sorry, we're kind of putting several things together here this morning. If you're a special study group leader uh, and you have your invitation uh, printout to give me, uh, give, actually give it to Darian up here in the front. Um, you can do that after class. Um, I want, I better turn the lights all the way off. Okay. I want to show you this YouTube uh, video. I, well, I want you to take a peek at it. It's going to be part of your homework to look at this. We'll be talking about the, the quantum spectrum of hydrogen today at the end of lecture. And I'll refer to this particular video in YouTube. And it's going to be one of your study um, activities tonight to, uh, to view it and think about what you see in this video. And I'm also going to be talking about it in lecture. So um, anyways, you can look at that a little bit later. Go to presentation mode and switch over to the laptop, if you please. All right. Um, so here's our outline for the day. A couple things I want to uh, go over with you, and that is uh, specifically concerning Passover coming up. Uh, if you are a student that uh, celebrates Passover next week, uh, in the middle of the week being our uh, midterm exam three, I want you to try to please contact me either after lecture today, which I think we'll dismiss a little bit early today so we can do that, and or also uh, contact me inside uh, web courses in the inbox messaging system uh, for confidential discussion. Uh, so that we can coordinate on excused absence and what and whatnot. And I've already talked to a few students about this. So if that applies to you, um, yeah, definitely check in with me in the next day or so. All right. Now, as I mentioned on Tuesday, we have, oh boy, I forgot to talk about special study groups. All right. I, I don't have any slides about it, but I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, we have exam three coming up. Special study groups, now listen carefully, uh, I'm going to open up special study groups uh, tonight at 9 o'clock. Okay, so the sign-ups page will activate at 9 o'clock p.m., all right, because I'm extremely, uh, I have an extremely hectic schedule today, but hopefully by 9 p.m. everything will be done, and let me remind you that if you want to sign up for special study groups and study in a special study group and then um, get four bonus points for studying and then do better on the exam even uh, independent of the bonus points uh, you have to sign up and you have to do it quickly because um, I'll open up the I'll activate the link into the sign ups page at nine o'clock and by 905 your group if you know if you've looked at the groups and stuff uh, it might be gone so just be ready look at the schedule page and I've already filled in uh, some uh, special study group session information you know we've got some on Friday tomorrow uh, we've got some on Saturday we've got one on Sunday afternoon so far uh, we've got a bunch on Monday and I got another few uh, printouts up here at the beginning of class, so uh, we'll have those in there. Uh, uh, so d double check the schedule page. I talked about it last time. It has a picture of a couple guys. Uh, one of them uh, has a, can you actually, could you log out of this now and log into web courses so the students can see it? I want them to see what they got. All right, so uh, it's got a, Distinctive picture. Darian's going to log in. And I don't know if, what, what you guys feel like, but I always wish I had more hours in the day. You know, specifically so I could do more and then also so that I could sleep more. I always tend to sacrifice sleep. Okay, can you slide in there? Is it going? Good. Yeah, it's just taking forever to load. Okay, switch to this display. Go back to the home page. Oh. 
Okay, here's the home page. A um, couple pictures, uh, Frankie and Benji. Kind of cool looking photos. Uh, go ahead and click into the exam page. It's under construction, and there's a couple guys, nerdly looking guys at the top. And uh, I've got some people, the, um, some SSG leaders in here. These guys haven't given me their time and place yet. But if you go down a little bit, they've all said, yes, I'll do it. Uh, and here's Ashley, and uh, she's got a Friday session, and uh, keep going down. There's Christiana, Saturday. Uh, here's one, uh, Javier Alvarenga on, on Sat uh, Sunday. And then we got a couple, Elizabeth, she's in this lecture. Uh, she's going to be going Monday afternoon. And so it's organized. Go back to the top, please. You'll be able to click on... Uh, click on Saturday. You click on the Saturday sessions button at the top. It'll take you right down there. And you can look. So if you only have time on Saturday in your schedule, just you know, click that button. And otherwise, look them all over. And I'm going to be put. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to be putting more people in there, more data in there uh, for explicit. Um, you'll have a mugshot and time and place and where, you know, a lot of people you use the library, the study rooms up there, they seem to work good. And anyways, you'll, you'll be able to look at it and uh, make your, um, make your plans. Okay, switch back to the laptop. Uh, so you can, you'll be able to click in there. Oh, switch back to that one more time. Okay. Um. This box, go ahead to the red box where it says signups link. Right below the picture of the two nerd balls, uh, that's where the sign, the link is that you click it and you'll go to the signups page. All right. Now, special study group leaders, you're already going to be signed up. So you don't have to worry about it. You'll be able to go in there and look who signs up, though, for your group. And the rest of you um, will be able to go in. And the way that you join a group, basically, is you click. And you click to join the one that you think is good, and then you're in. And then you go to the session and hopefully benefit from it, and you get some bonus points for studying. Okay, now we'll go back to the regular display. Thanks, Darian. All right, so a couple other things I want to go over to get you ready for exam three. Um, we've been doing a lot of hop, skipping, and jumping. Uh, we've done a lot in chapter 7, a little bit of chapter 8, uh, 9, and 10. Uh, and, it, it, you know, so going back to this lecture, 19, with the picture of the surfer in Hawaii where we started talking about waves and so forth, and all the way up to what we talk about today, the spectrum of hydrogen, uh, will be on this exam. Be ready for anything. We've got calculations. Um, the homework 15, it, there'll be a study assignment for you tonight, too. Uh, so I guess that will be homework 17. Um, homework 15, the analysis of the two audio signals, the visual analysis of that, expect to have something like that on the test. All right, so make sure you study that. And if you didn't understand it, um, when you were doing, like I talked to a student yesterday, and he said, you know, Dr. B, I got it right, but I don't understand exactly how that's the right answer. Uh, so definitely you want to study that. Uh, um, and I'm, I usually don't, write a list of all the concepts and stuff. I don't really do study guides, but it is a good challenge for you, and it's, a, it's actually a study task for you to go through your notes and then the textbook, and you can see, okay, well, this part of Chapter 7, uh, this part of Chapter 8, Dr. B talked about, ooh, actually, this part of not Chapter 9, yeah, he talked about the nucleus and stuff. Uh, that's a good study uh, task for you, so... I'll let you go ahead and do that um, on your own. Question. 
Yeah, the homework tonight is going to be like a mini review type homework. So it's going to, I guess it won't be homework 17. It'll be a second mini review. So, but it'll, it'll have stuff about today's lecture. So, and Tuesday's lecture. So, uh, most of the stuff that you've got to do is read right now. Okay, there's going to be a code question using the eye clicker. So ultra, 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 be ultra paranoid about bringing your eye clicker. It's going to be on the test. Okay. And what else do you need to bring? Uh, same thing as always. A good pencil and an eraser. Good eraser. Uh, raspberry colored Scantron with the UCF Pegasus logo. Your eye clicker, a calculator. Uh, you may not use a cell phone during the test. Uh, and you already know that. So, uh, you know, just more uh, of the same. Now, questions uh, before I proceed <coughs> concerning exam three. Maria. I have that. It's the next slide. Okay, as Maria just prompted me, there's a special SI review tonight, 4 to 6. Classroom building 2, that's this building, uh, downstairs in room 106. Looks good. And by the way, there's also the regular session at 1.30 this afternoon. So uh, if you can make one or the other, do it. As they say, just do it. And it will definitely help you uh, get ready for the exam. Remember, the more that you can interact with another human being, either Darian in discussions or me in office hours, um, Maria in SI or the SI review, Caroline, Caroline has office hours Friday afternoon at 1.30. Uh, the more, and even your study partners, if you have a, a good study partner that's, that you know is doing pretty good and you guys buddy up together, uh, that is going to help you to A, learn the material, and, and B, on the exam, you're going to move with greater confidence because you will all, working with another person forces you to think. And you'll have already thought through, hopefully, some of the things that you'll be looking at on the exam, and that's true for all my exams. So you always want to read carefully, and you always want to think, and that's the way you really get a good grade. Okay, final call for questions concerning exam three. Okay, I see no more questions. Let's continue. I want to talk about gravity versus electricity. We mentioned it last time when we were looking at the Van de Graaff generator. You know, that big gold sphere at the top of the generator that, um, that Frankie was um, brave enough to, to touch. And But before we did that, I put that little... Um, uh, the, the little device, which was kind of like a, um, a uh, an audio jack for 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 headphones that you uh, plug into a fancy uh, stereo system, and it had strings attached to it. And when we turned on the generator, the strings all um, lifted up against gravity, and the electrical forces easily dominated. Uh, gravity, even for Frankie's hair. Her hair was able to lift up against gravity. And actually, all of chemistry is in that uh, advantage that electricity has over gravitation. Gravitation doesn't disappear. But what we're going to show right now is that the electrical interaction, the Coulomb interaction, is very, very uh, much greater in strength uh, meter for meter, newton for newton, uh, than gravitation is. So what we're going to do is look at a neutral hydrogen atom. Now, a neutral hydrogen atom, as you know, has one proton, and it's symbolized here in this 
uh, slide P plus, uh, plus superscript. And it has one electron, and the electron is bound to an E minus, uh, the minus sign being the superscript. And we're going to say that, you know, there's a certain distance R between the proton and the electron. We're not going to specify it, but we're going to study it. Now, the second diagram down here is all gray because there's no differentiation between proton and electron gravitationally except for their mass. The, the blue and the red I typically use to signify uh, minus charge for blue and, and plus charge for red, but there's no such thing as that gravitationally. So I made the second diagram here uh, uh, gray, you know, grayscale image of the proton and the electron. All right, now, in the lowest energy state for hydrogen, and we're actually going to talk about it, the ground state, the Bohr radius, uh, R is about 0 0.05 nanometers. All right, that's 5 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Now, don't worry about memorizing that. Um, that's the value of it. And what we're going to find is that the distance... It uh, doesn't really matter in the comparison that we're about to uh, construct. And that's because, you know, in the, the electron and the, the proton, they're interacting, you know, whatever distance they are apart, they have some electromagnetic attraction and they have some gravitational uh, attraction, some Newtons of both flavor. And they're both, you know, and it doesn't matter what the distance is. You know, if you're just thinking about a hydrogen atom or a proton and an electron, it could be, you know, two light years away. And what we're doing today would still work. But if we're thinking about an atom, an atom typical size is about 0.05 nanometers. And that's called the Bohr radius after the famous Danish scientist Niels Bohr. Okay, so the proton and the electron interact, as I mentioned um, gravitationally, they interact because they have mass. That's what mass does. If there's some kilograms in, in the area, you are going to interact with it. That's what Sir Isaac Newton figured out. Coulomb figured out that electromagnetically, the charges will interact, and each of them has a, a, a certain amount of charge. Okay? And so our task today is to figure out, all right, they're, they're interacting no matter what the distance, you know, 0.05 nanometers or 0.05 light years or anywhere in between. Uh, so what we're going to try to do is figure out which, in, which interaction is stronger. So we're going to um, compare the force of gravity and the force of electromagnetism between electron and proton. And you could do this for any nucleus, but hydrogen is just simpler to, to model and look at. Okay, questions before I continue? Okay. Um, I want you to write down a small table here of figures. And um, we're not going to, you're going to write some stuff down. We're going to stack all these numbers together. And then I'm going to show, show you what they calculate out to. Okay, so the two particles that we're thinking about are the electron and the proton. They have charge, each of them, and they each have mass. The charge of the electron, as we've mentioned, negative 1.60. Uh, times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Coulombs being a household size unit of charge. And uh, the electron size uh, unit of charge E is uh, quite a bit smaller, as you can see. So that's negative E. Proton, positive E, 1.60 positive, times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And those two um, charges are the same size but different sign. 
The mass of the electron, however, and this is something that I mentioned last time, is quite a bit smaller. In kilograms, it's 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. Now, don't worry about how to put this in on your calculator. You're not going to have to do this on the test. The bottom line of all these numbers and putting them all together, yeah, you're going to want to remember that for the test. But calculating, you know, in scientific notation with this, not so much. Anyways, it's pretty small. And then proton is pretty small, but actually it's, it's quite a bit bigger than the, the electron. As small as the proton is, it's about 1,837 times, approximately 2,000, as I mentioned last time, uh, larger kilogram for kilogram. So the size ratio, the, f the fourth level down on this table, uh, is something that we want to keep in mind. The, the ratio of the charge is this one to one. In other words, they're the same size. Okay? But the mass sizes are way out of that proportion anyway. They're not two to one. It's not three to one. It's 1 to 1,837. <coughs> and as I said, that's roughly uh, 1 to 2,000. Now, that's not going to really affect things for us because uh, you can't mix apples and oranges. So, you know, the charge and the mass, the masses are going to be attracting no matter how big they are, and the charges are going to be attracting no matter what, how, how big they are. But we definitely need these numbers in here uh, for the, the calculations that we're going to do. Now, let's go back to this set of sketches. And I've kind of, you know, separated two, two sketches to look at. It's, it's one interaction. Now, I'm going to use um, uh, these pictures for just a little bit longer. One thing I want to modify is the size of the electron and the proton. Now the upper left diagram, the red proton, the blue electron in the upper left, I'm not going to change the size of it. Those two guys, Devin, I'm going to leave those at the same size because the size ratio, charge-wise, is one-to-one. -one. So we'll just leave those two guys uh, as they are. However, the mass ratio uh, for this uh, the gravitational interaction, I'm going to change the size of this one. Now, here's how you can change the size in a realistic manner. The mass goes by volume. So if you have more volume, you have more mass, right? If you're, you know, a nucleus or something like that, okay? So if you have 1,837 times the mass... Um, that means you have 1,837 times the volume, all right? Now, 1,837 times the volume does not mean you have 1,837 times the radius. What it means is you have 12.25 times the radius because, and go ahead and write this down. I didn't, I, I should have, but I didn't. You can add it into your notes. 12.25 to the third power is approximately 1,837. And if you have a calculator, you can verify that. 12.25 to the third power, ching, 1,837, approximately. All right? So if the mass is 1,837, the radii are going to be about 1 to 12.25. And that's still pretty big. Right? And the reason I have to go with radii here is because I'm drawing circles, I'm making these circles look like three-dimensional objects, but it's really circles. So I had to figure out, okay, well, let me make my circles, you know, one of them smaller, one of them bigger, and so the shape is, you know, approximately 12 times bigger. All right, here's what it looks like. Boing, boing, boing. Look at that. All right, if the if the electron size was proportional to its mass, this is what it would look like, okay? Now, we're not going to use that sketch, but you can draw it in if you want. 
you know, ginormous proton uh, in black and white. And then a little teeny down here, uh, electron, E minus. Yeah, you could say that the pro this is why the proton doesn't move very, very much inside of a, inside of a crystal lattice inside of the, your, nu your nucleus. Um, you know, the, the nuclei of the atoms in a crystal or a metallic lattice or any kind of a solid, they'll, they'll move a little bit. They'll oscillate back and forth, you know, as the, as the temperature of the solid increases. You know, they'll be rattling back and forth on their matrix, uh, on, their, uh, on their grid, but they don't really go anywhere. The things that go somewhere are the electrons, and you can kind of see why that's the case here, right? Because they're, the they're the little shrimpy guys. So this is like your mom or your dad telling you to go get them. Go get the newspaper. Go get the mail. You know, go get... You know, my big brother, when I was a little kid, he was mean. He would, you know, when, when he, he, uh, he learned how to drive and he had a car. And so if we wanted to go anywhere... You know, Stephen, can you take us to the move? Can you take us to the grocery store? Can you take us, you know, and he's, and he'd be, you know, my parents, we, we all, my, my two brothers and I, we all lived in the same bedroom. You know, my three sisters, I had three sisters and they each had their own bedroom. And then my parents had their own bedroom. And <laughs> so they crammed us three boys and it was, it was pretty wild and woolly in there. So, but anyways, we spent a lot of time in there and we had a TV in there and stuff like that. So we'd be watching TV and, oh, let's go down, you know, let's go to get some ice cream or, you know, whatever. And so, come on, Stephen, take us down there. And he'd say, okay, go get my sneakers. And so we'd go get his sneakers, you know, downstairs. And, he, and, he, <laughs> and he'd say, okay, put them on. And, and my brother... <laughs> Anyways, my brother was like this proton, and me and my little brother were like the electrons. We're the ones that went hustling and bustling to get things done. The proton is just kind of sitting there like a slacker. Anyway, what we're going to do is use the numbers to do the talking. So stupid uh, Dr. B's stories aside, let's put the numbers in there, just the way Sir Isaac Newton and Charles Coulomb uh, from Paris, France, figured it out. And let's let the numbers do the talking and see which force is stronger. And by how much? We know that, we know that the electrical force is going to be stronger. But how much stronger? That's what we want to know. So let's, let's take a look at this. Here we go. All right, now I want you to write this down carefully. Uh, up here, gravitation. My Siri just found something on it. Dude. Siri just found, just answered my question. Good. I've never had that happen before. Anyway, so GM1, M2, and actually it's M electron, M proton. M subscript E, M subscript P in the numerator, R squared in the denominator. And then in the square brackets up there in the top, is that that's the actual value of G, Newton's constant. 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Yuck. But go ahead and write it down because we're going to get rid of all those yucky units and stuff like that. I mean, let's write it in there one time. Now the mass of the electron, we already know that, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 20. Whoa, I wrote it in the wrong order. That's the mass of the proton. The middle, per, the, the first set of parentheses in the middle of the numerator, that's the mass of the proton. I'll have to change that for the, for the next class. Uh, and then 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31, that's the mass of the electron. So I got them kind of flip flopped in order, but it's the same. You know, multiply two numbers, you can do first one, then the other, or reverse the order. And then R squared in the denominator. And my wonderful students, it is nasty looking, but we got more nastiness coming. Because down here at the bottom, yep, here's what the electromagnetic, the Coulomb interaction shapes up to be. Now, this one has a different constant, K. 
and it uses, Kimmy, uh, the two charges. Now, these are two numbers that are the same size, 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19, all right? So down here in where I have the square bracket, uh, yeah, that's the size of Coulomb's constant in the metric system. So kilograms, meters, seconds, amperes, amperes of current in the metric system, uh, 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb, all right? That's your constant. And then the other two are proton. And yeah, see, I have these, these things slightly out of order. I'll have to change that for next hour. Uh, first one is the proton charge because it's positive. Second one, second parentheses, uh, negative 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. Yuck. Yucky. Very nasty looking. All right, but we're going to do something nice because what we're going to do is take the ratio of these two babies. All right, so we're going to take the ratio, uh, strong one, electrical, so F subscript E divided by F subscript G. All right, and so that's going to uh, help us uh, rearrange things and get the numbers put together. Uh, one of the nice things uh, about this is the fact that if if I take the ratio, I have this this monstrosity up here on top that's going into the denominator. So my denominator is a bunch of numbers divided by r squared. And then this junk down here in the bottom, that's going in the numerator of my ratio. And that's a bunch of numbers divided by r squared. So in actuality, you can burn off the r squared. It doesn't come in to the ratio. It cancels out. And that's where it's starting to sweeten up. So we're ditching a little bit of nastiness here. All right. So the R squared up there and then the R squared down below, yeah, they're out of here. All right, so go ahead and just ching, slice and dice those babies right on out of there. All right, now let's go to the next page. All right, and let me just, um, whew, boy, a lot of writing today. Here it is. There's the ratio. Oh, my goodness. But actually, if you look at it, you can see that there's a common structure, numerator and denominator. There's a, frac there's a constant of proportionality, K on top, G on the bottom. And then there's the two intrinsic properties, the intrinsic charge of the proton and its intrinsic mass, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Right? And then uh, also on top, the intrinsic charge of the electron, negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And below that, its intrinsic mass, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. All right. Now, I'm going to park that up at the top here. All right. So all that stuff's up here now. All right. Now, let's clean it up a little bit. Here we go. Okay, so I'm focused on this stuff up here. And what we're going to do uh, is we're going to take all the numeric parts and then all the powers of 10 and kind of separate them and deal with them separately. All right. So my 8.99 right here, that goes into the... I'm. I'm Putting, I'm pushing its power 10 off to the side for a second. And let's just deal with 8.99, because we can deal with that easy. Similarly, 1.60, right there. All right. Put that in its own little parenthesis. All right. That's the charge of the proton in the numerator. 
And then, all right, charge of the electron, negative 1.60. And we're parking all the powers of 10 off to the right. Now, the powers of 10 in the numerator, let's see what we got. We got 9, negative 19, and another negative 19. So that means, let's see, negative 19 times 2, that's negative 38. Negative 38 and a positive 10. So that's negative 29. So I have 10 to the minus 29 right here. And also, I've got Newtons. That's it. The numerator gives me a number of Newtons. Something times 10 to the minus 29. All right. And that's the electromagnetic interaction. That's the side, that's the, you know, I'm going to drop the minus sign here in just a minute. But Now, we also got the denominator of that top equation. It's kind of painful. Let's just do it one time in your life, and then we'll be done. All right, just park that 6.67 square brackets down below. And it's power 10. We're going to push it off to the, off to the right over here. All right. And then 1.67, yeah. Park that down in the denominator, all right? And its power of 10 is going to go off to the, off to the right. And then uh, 9.11 from the mass of the electron. Yeah, just park that down. That's the, the uh, second parenthesis in the denominator. And then i got to do my powers of 10. So let's see. The, the top equation, the denominator has a 10 to the minus 11. 10 to the minus 27, and 10 to the minus 31. All right, so let's see. 11 plus 27 is 38. 38 plus 31 is 69. So that's 10 to the minus 69. And then there's units of Newtons. All right, and we're still not done. All right, so here's my, here's the mass of the electron going over there. All right. Now, in this equation here, 10 to the minus 29 in the numerator and 10 to the minus 69 in the denominator, those two can now be combined, all right? So that's 10 to the 40th. Because remember, 10 to the minus something in the denominator is like 10 to the regular something in the numerator. So it's like having 10 to the minus 29 times 10 to the positive 69, both in the numerator, Darian. And then, all right, and then the numeric part up here, can you, can somebody verify me on this? 8.99, 1.6, and negative 1.6. Should work out to about 23 negatory. Does that, anybody verify that? Who verifies? You got it? Good? You got it? All right. Anybody else over here verify? You got it? Okay, good. All right. Now, the new, the, that's the numerator. The denominator, the slightly different. That Go ahead and verify that one. That should work out to 101. Okay. And, hey, you guys. The main thing here is, and then the Newtons cancel. The main thing here is this baby up here, 10 to the 40. The number in front of it, it's that's going to be about negative 0 0.2, right? Right. That's not that important. The important thing is the power of 10. The strength ratio between the electromagnetic and the gravitational interaction, therefore, is approximately 10 to the 40th. That's a 1 followed by 40 zeros. All right? And that, my wonderful students, is ginormulous. Uh, you can't even... There's, there's nothing in that we know of in the universe that... 
has got 10 to the 40th power of anything. You know, so like um, a gram of carbon has got about, um, let's see, about 10 to the 24 atoms of carbon in it, right? Or 10 to the 25, I should say. A gram of water is going to have a little bit more water molecules in it, okay? Um, and so uh, we don't know of anything that's that there's 10 to the 40th of them, except for this. It's an enormous advantage. Now, um, make a note to yourself. Because, and this is why we're, this is the bottom line. The ratio of the force strength is 10 to the 40th. For this reason, when we're studying atoms and their interactions, we ignore gravity. Right? Now, astronomically, we can't do that. But when we're talking about chemistry experiments in the chemistry lab, or cooking something in the oven, it's all electromagnetic. You know, when you're baking something, you know, you put in some yeast, and the yeast produces carbon dioxide. That's basically uh, electromagnetism at work. The gravitation doesn't enter into it, except that the whole blob of dough is, is, um, is you know, gravitating onto the, onto the, uh, the baking dish. Uh, when you walk... Everybody, when they walk out of here, you're going to walk up the aisle, except the people that go out by the, the side door over here. Right? But if you walk up the aisle, your thigh muscles, basically, are defeating the earth itself. The gravitational interaction between you and the earth is, you know, so many Newtons. But you're, and, and the earth is ginormous. But that doesn't matter because that interaction is gravitational. Okay? Your thigh muscles, all the calories of energy that you burn in your, in your thigh muscles, go, just going up this, up this ramp to the back door of the lecture hall. That's all electrical. That's water and uh, adenosine triphosphate and all that stuff. All that stuff's electrical. Chemistry is mostly electrical. And this is the reason for it. All right, so that's the, the moral. So don't worry about these bodacious numbers up there at the top. We looked at them. We're done looking at them. Do remember this. Electricity, 10 to the 40th times stronger than gravity. Centimeter for centimeter. Newton for Newton. All right. Now let me pause for questions. Okay, let's keep going. Next topic, volts and joules and electron volts. And we need this idea of electron volts for talking about atoms, and I'll show you why that's the case. Now, I want you to think of the positively charged sphere we had on Tuesday. You know, the Van de Graaff generator is a picture of... Um, Frankie, uh, here's a picture of Benji from the noon section, and his hair really flew out into the universe. It was kind of amazing. But they were in contact with the positively charged metal sphere at the top of the Van de Graaff generator. All right. Now, as we mentioned, the field lines uh, of the Van de Graaff or uh, of a positively charged sphere, uh, they move radially, radially outward. Okay, we drew a picture of it. We drew a picture of a negatively charged sphere as well. And for them, the field lines moved radially inward. Now, the thing about it is a small test charge that's positive will move outward. And that's how you define the field lines. The field lines are the direction of the acceleration of a teeny positive test charge. You know, we just decide, well, let's use a positive. 
And that defines the direction of the, the field lines. The problem with that is if you put a negative charge over there, you can certainly do it, put a little electron over there. What's it going to do? It's going to do the exact opposite. So we have to deal with that. All right, now let's take a look at this. That red uh, piece of, go ahead and draw your, your sphere. Okay, and I've got a bunch of plus signs. The field lines go out radially like spokes of a wagon wheel. In three dimensions, it would be like, you know, quills on a porcupine. Okay, so this is kind of a, this is kind of a two-dimensional view. And let's start the positive test charge fairly close to the surface. I drew a, a dotted line circle around the surface. Okay. The, the black field lines are going radially outward from the surface. And the positive test charge, yeah, it would definitely, it would go from the inner circle. All right, now look at what I'm going to do here. Animation time. Ching. It would move towards the outer circle. Okay, because that's, that's what the small positive test charge would do. Now... As I asked you last time, what does that tell you about large potential energy and small potential energy? That tells you that the larger electrical potential energy for the positive charge is close. But if you analyze the motion of a negative charge, which you could easily do, you know, like an electron, no problem with that. Um, the electron, here's my animation, the electron would tend to move down to the closer level. It wants to get closer. So what that means is for the electron, the higher electrical potential energy is far away from the sphere. For the, for the positive charge, it's closer to the sphere and it goes down to zero to a lower number far away from the sphere. But for the electron, it's just the opposite. And that's kind of a difficulty. Okay? Now, gravitationally, we don't have that confusion. If you have um, uh, a basketball six meters up and you swap it out, you know, it's going to have a certain amount of potential energy up at that position, you know, like six meters up. And then you put an apple up there you know, it's going to have a certain amount of potential energy. And then if you bring them both down to a lower level, like three meters, you know, there's going to be less potential energy there, more kinetic. That's free fall. Okay. So gravitationally, there's no confusion. But electromagnetically, because of the repel attract bifurcation of the force, you can have this, you know, and it's not hard to keep track. Well, I shouldn't say it's not hard to to keep track of. It is hard to keep track of. It's not hard to understand. It's hard to keep track of. And so what mathematicians and physicists have done uh, from about the days of Coulomb, we've used an abstraction. The abstraction of the electrical potential energy uh, called volts. And we just said, all right, let's just define something independent of the charge because, yeah, in other words, to, to actually know how many joules you've got from point A to point B, you've got to know if it's a positive or a negative. I mean, it might be plus 10 joules or it might be minus 10 joules. Okay? So what, what they decided to do is we'll just orient everything to this complete abstraction. Uh, we'll extract or abstract out the charges. And we'll just say that volts are high near the sphere, near a positive array of charge, and that they're lower as you move away. Now, potential energy might or might not be higher near the sphere. Depends on what you've got. But we've just decided to go with volts. And this way, you, you kind of sidestep all the trouble with... Um, 
the charge of your test particle. You know, so if, if you're running a big atom smasher and you're sending positive gold nuclei it, through your atom smasher, you know, those are positive, okay? And they're going to have certain potential energies. But if you're running electrons through your atom smasher, they're negative. It's going to be completely different. But you still have to be able to design everything and do all the math and stuff. And the way that we do that is by using this abstraction of volts. Okay, so a volt is a joule per coulomb. Write that down. The volt is one joule per coulomb. And it is what we use as the intrinsic uh, analog to electrical potential energy. And Elizabeth, in that, we kind of sidestep the confusion of, you know, what do the electrons do? And what do the protons do? You know, they because they're you know, one electron wants to go this way, a proton wants to go this way, and that's can, kind of confusing. Uh, so, uh, and and you know, it's it's uh, something that scientists have to deal with. So to keep at least something simple, the uh, the mathematical array around a source of charge like this sphere, uh, we use the concept of volts. So let's go back to this. This, um, this outline here, Frankie and, and Benji. Um, so we use the abstraction of volts. Um, and here's what we say. We say that the protons drop to a lower voltage. You know, they go from high voltage to low voltage. That's what protons want to do. And then those blessed electrons, they are completely bass awkward, as the saying goes. They go exactly the other way. They're kind of like maniacs. You know, most people, they, they try to, whoa, whoa, high voltage, let me get away from that. That's what protons do. But electrons, phew, they like to live dangerously. They want to go, you know, they want to go towards the high voltage. All right? So that's the idea of a volt. Right? So... A charge times a voltage is a bit of energy, okay? And the voltage is an analog of energy, or in fact, of potential energy, and it's abstracted away from the charge array. Uh, by the way, I was reading the textbook, the chapter 8, and the other word for voltage is electrostatic potential, okay? And that's also related to the terminology potential energy. Now, I tend to use the word voltage just to, you know, keep uh, something uh, consistent and fairly simple. Anyways, one coulomb times one volt is one joule. So if you have a, if you have a, a wire... And the, the volt, it, and you, you're connected to a one volt battery, and one coulomb comes out of your battery and around the wire and back to the other end, that's going to do one joule of work along the way. Now, it might, might heat up, you know, the wire with one joule of thermal energy, or it might, you know, lift something or turn something. But, yeah, one joule of, of work is going to be, ideally anyways, coming out of that. Now... A second example of this, charge times voltage equals energy, is the electron volt. One fundamental charge E times one volt is one electron volt. And it's going to be units of work, units of energy. But this is the one that's pretty small. And it's the one that's definitely the right size for studying atoms because it's oriented to the electron. So one electron volt, yeah, it's definitely work, definitely energy, but it's pretty shrimpy. 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. But that's the, the energy unit uh, that you would use if you're studying uh, atoms and molecules, the electron volt. So let's take a look at it now. All right, let's take a look at hydrogen. 
Right? So now we're talking about the energy levels of hydrogen. And this is going to bring us to that YouTube video um, in a few minutes. We've been observing hydrogen for over 100 years. When we put a bit of hydrogen into a glass tube, as you'll see on YouTube, um, and we put some voltage between the top and the bottom of the pure, uh, tube of pure hydrogen, the hydrogen glows. It emits colors, but only certain colors. The pure hydrogen emits a specific set of colors and no other. So it, it doesn't generate all the colors of the rainbow. Now, th the sun is an incandescent light source. Any kind of thermal light source, even these lamps up here, uh, they'll generate a rainbow. All the colors of the rainbow. Okay, anytime you see an incandescent light, anything that's hot, it's go if it's if it's visible, if it's you know like if it's white hot like the sun, it's going to produce you know all the colors of the rainbow. So the the colors of the rainbow in order are uh, go ahead and write this this down. Famous name Roy G. Biv. The famous scientist, Roy G. Biv. R-O-Y, red, orange, yellow. Middle initial G for green. Biv, B-I-V, blue, indigo, violet. All right, now that's a continuous spectrum. Uh, but hydrogen itself, if you have pure hydrogen, and you're not heating it up so it's ink. I mean, you can get hydrogen to be incandescent. But if, you, if you're just putting, if you're keeping it relatively cool, but zapping it with some voltage, this is what it will produce, certain specific colors, and you'll see them on the YouTube. So from that, we've deduced the following, that the electrons, they only live at certain specific orbits, and those orbits are countable. Now my picture here, oh my goodness, my electron is off. Ah, that electron should be on one of the two energy levels here, or one of the four energy levels. My picture is, draw, draw your electron on one of those circles. It's supposed to be there. I don't know if I can, I think I can amend that on the YouTube. Okay. This idea of countable and specific orbits is the quantum principle. When we say that something's quantized, that means it comes in units of energy or units of mass or units of charge. The quantum of charge is the electron, the fundamental charge of the electron. That's the quantum of charge. You know, and there are quanta of, uh, of energy, and there are quanta of angular momentum. Planck's constant. It's coming. Thanks, constant. I told you we were going to be studying it, and we're going to be. Since the electrical potential energy is the energy of position, and since your orbital levels are restricted, that means that electrical potential energy is also restricted. So that's why we say that energy is quantized. Now, this is true for every atom. It's particularly easy to do uh, for... Uh, hydrogen. It's the simplest atom. But we've done it for other atoms and stuff. It's kind of tricky. Once you get past hydrogen, the simplest, you know, even trying to do uh, helium is kind of tricky to do, but we can, we've can. we been working at it. But yeah, the, the quantized energy levels. Now here's why it's important to see. When, when you're uh, on top of a hill, or if you're at the top of the, the, uh, the back of the classroom and you get on a skateboard, you're going to go naturally to lower energy, lower potential energy, right? Electrons will naturally drop from higher to lower potential energy around the, electro around the, the proton, okay? When they do that, they drop very specific amounts of energy, delta E. 
Right? And if they, you know, if you zap a hydrogen atom with energy, it'll boost the electron, but only by a certain amount of energy, because only certain orbits are allowed. All right, now, what are those energy levels? Okay, here they are. Let's take a look at this. This is item three. Right. The energy levels in the traditional accounting scheme, uh, we don't start with a low positive number or zero. We actually start in the negatives. So for the ground state, n equals one, and this picture is, is righteous. Uh, the electrons on the n equals one energy level. Uh, we've measured that, and that energy level is negative 13.6 electron volts. The next level up, the n equals 2, and make a note of it, this is the first excited state. Uh, that's negative 3.4. Still negative by our accounting scheme, but it's, it's closer to the positives than negative 13.6. By the way, what's uh, 3.4 times 4? Yeah, that's right. Coincidence? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, what's 1.5 times 9? Yeah. Coincidence? I don't think so. So it's actually it rounds off closer to 13.6. N equals 3, the third energy level, negative 1.5. The fourth energy level, negative 0 0.9. Yeah. Every energy level has a, every orbital level has a specific energy because it's a certain distance away from the nucleus, right? It's just like gravitational potential energy. Certain distance up for the basketball, certain potential energy. Okay. Now we, on the basketball example, we traditionally make the lowest potential energy state zero. But here, um, scientists have used the lowest potential energy as uh, negative 13.6. Now, this energy series, the set of energies and, and energy levels, keeps going. As the energy level number goes to bigger and bigger, so put a, a right rightward arrow and an infinity sign, the energy of that level goes to, to zero, okay? So uh, an electron wants to go from zero down to a deeper, lower potential energy. Good. That's what electron, I mean, if an electron is near a proton, this is what it's going to do. For this reason, we say that the binding energy of the ground state electron, n equals 1, is 13.6. Meaning that the distance between infinity and, or, and the ground state is 13.6. By the way, students, for number 6 there, number 3, uh, item six, uh, put the word ionization. Because if you're at that, inf you know, infinite energy level, if you've got more than, thir if you've got an electron zapped by 13.7 electron volts, it's out of here. You're out, you're, you're no longer bound to the electron and you've got 0.1 electron volts of kinetic energy. You're out of here, all right? So 13.6 um, is also known as the ionization energy. Binding energy, if you think of binding. Ionization energy, if you think of, you know, ionizing the atom. You know, busting loose one of the electrons. Now, first excited state, n equals 2, a little bit easier. 3.4. So it's 3.4 down from infinity, 3.4 down from totally unbound. All right? That's the binding energy. Uh, so which one's easier to grab? Which one's easier to steal? Well, the, the n equals 2 is easier to steal. 
N equals one is tougher. You need a little bit more energy, four times as much energy to, to bolt that baby out of there. But N equals two, yeah, it's cinchy, relatively speaking. N equals three, even easier, so on and so forth. So by the time you get up to N equals 10, you can just about breathe on it and it'll be ionized, all right? Now, I'm going to give you a, a homework assignment, uh, two homework assignments. First one is going to be a conventional uh, homework assignment uh, in web courses, and it'll be kind of a study assignment. And the second assignment is to look at this Spectrum of Hydrogen video it's in the demonstrations playlist. And are you listening? Because I'm about to tell you something important. I'm going to ask you two questions on the exam about this video. All right, so make sure that you look at it. One regular question, one bonus point question. All right, now it might be one point and one point. Or it might be one point and two points. Right? But I'll ask you two questions. Okay, lights up, please. You're dismissed. Uh, students uh, that want to talk about Passover, come up to the front if you want. Uh, special study group leaders, I'll talk to you guys too. 11, okay. 12, is that